Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this public program sponsored by the Massachusetts Historical Society. My name is Kanasoran Wall Street Channel. I am the director of research here at the MHS. You generally find me uh, hosting our seminars, our various seminar series over the course of the academic year or at a conference or something like that. And that's because the research department generally deals with works in progress. And we, uh, and, and we also support a lot of fellowships uh, over the course of the year as well. But this is a very special occasion because this is one of those uh, moments when we get to see the completion of a project. Our guest today, our wonderful guest today, has spent uh, a lot of time at the Massachusetts Historical Society, has received uh, several uh, fellowships from the MHS, and we are always so thrilled to see those projects just grow and blossom and turn into wonderful books like the one she's going to tell us about today. Adrian Chastain Weimer is professor of history at Providence College, where she teaches numerous courses, including North American Religious History, Religious Freedom and Its Limits, Roger Williams in History and Memory, and Martyrs, Poets, and Revolutionaries, Early Modern England and North America. A scholar of colonial America and early modern religion and politics, she is the author of numerous works, including the monographs Martyrs Mirror, Persecution and Holiness in Early New England, and the volume she's here to talk about today, A Constitutional Culture, New England and the Struggle Against Arbitrary Rule in the Restoration Empire. Professor Weimer's scholarship has been sponsored by numerous institutions and, and, and organizations, including the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Folger Shakespeare Library, the American Antiquarian Society, and as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Massachusetts Historical Society. She is currently working on two projects, a history of Deer Island, the site in Boston Harbor where Christian Native Americans were held during King Philip's or Metacom's War, and she is also co-editing the collected works of Daniel Gookin, the Bay Colony's Commissioner for Indian Affairs, who wrote histories about Christian or praying Indian communities and their wartime suffering. It is always a pleasure uh, to see her and to welcome her uh, back to the MHS, a longtime friend and supporter of the organization. And we're thrilled to have her here today to share her latest book with us. Welcome, Professor Weimer. Thank you, Kid, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Olivia, who's behind the scenes and has made all of this happen. Um, it's such a thrill to be here. The MHS feels like an academic home to me. I've spent so much time in the reading room and upstairs in the galleries and in meetings. And as Kit said, a fellowship at the MHS really made the research for this book possible. Um, most of all, I just want to, again, thank the staff at the MHS, Dan, Elaine, Peter, Sarah, Anna, Conrad, there's so many more, I can't name them all. Um, but you made the library such a welcoming place. And kid, you as well. I mean, making this really um, just such a fruitful place to do research and to feel a sense of community. And I have to say the staff at the MHS put up with, I wish I could see your faces, but you've put up with so many gazillions of weird questions from me about, you know, provenance of manuscripts and who put the collection together and how do the autograph files work and, you know, all these, I, I just really, really have benefited from the expertise of the staff. They are a remarkable bunch of people. So thank you for having me back. It's a delight to be here um, to talk about this book, which finally is in the world. So I have some slides. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, there's the book. And here's an object in the collections, uh, which I spent a lot of time with as I was researching. This is a strange volume. It is Thomas Danforth's notebook. It's strange for a number of reasons. First of all, it's strange because of its chronology. It bounces back and forth in time in unexpected patterns. For example, you know, Danforth on, on one page, he'll be including snippets from the charter crisis of the 1630s when the king, Charles I, tries to dissolve the Massachusetts Bay Charter and install a royal governor. Um, 
you know, this is way before anybody is thinking that Charles II or his brother James eventually might try to do the same thing. So, so it's weirdly prescient in that way. And then also the chronology is strange. You know, maybe Danforth went back and filled some things in that that could have happened. Maybe that explains some of the back and forth. Um, it's also strange because, you know, on one page, you're going to be reading these obscure legal citations. You know, Danforth is is not highly educated, but he's a he's a legal mind. He cares about legal details, and so he'll be you know putting these really obscure legal citations, and then right next to it, you'll find some poetry. You know, some limericks, <laughs> like almost almost ballad type. You know, sing in the tavern type poetry. And, you know, it's almost like the two sides of his brain are battling it out as you go through the pages of this notebook. Um, most importantly for this book, Danforth's notebook is strange because, because it records things that he's not supposed to record. So this notebook contains the only extant record of the 1666 debate among Massachusetts Bay leaders over the nature of arbitrary rule and the limits of royal authority. So to understand how strange that is, we have to know that, you know, the magistrates and the deputies, the elected members of the general court, the, the legislature in, in the colony, they're really not... It, not supposed to write things down. I mean, they, they it's important to them that they build consensus. There's lots of debates behind closed doors, but we just have very, very few examples of people recording debates. And that has to do with issues of consensus and really not wanting a kind of party politics, not wanting factions to emerge according to their older Christian humanist ideals of how government's supposed to work. There's There's a lot of reasons why you don't write down the debates among the magistrates. But in this case, Danforth does. He scribbles down notes. So, you know, what I'm thinking as I'm looking at this volume in the reading room at MHS is that, you know, maybe he just, he really thought this was important enough to write down. You know, he even uses initials to tell who's speaking. And it's not, I mean, the older printed version gets some of the initials, um, the attributions wrong. We, With the help of the MHA staff, we've got them right now. Um, but, but, you know, he identifies the speakers. And, you know, it almost is like he has a sense of himself as living history, that he's living in a historical moment that matters enough that he just had to get the details down on paper. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's other reasons why he wrote it down. So, so this was one of the most important sources for a certain section of the book. And, you know, in the big picture, we can say a lot of things about the people of early New England. A lot has been said. There's a lot still to say. They were far from perfect, of course. But one thing they did have is a radar for arbitrary rule, for noticing, for thinking about, for articulating drift towards absolutism, any kind of rule that wasn't bounded and that wasn't based in local elections. And so that's the issue of the 1666 debate. They're trying to figure out, you know, in what what are the powers that the crown has, the English monarch has? What are the powers that local institutions can have and what can they do and not do? Uh, what can the king do and what can the king not do? What are the limits on arbitrary rule? How do they detect it? How do they recognize it? How do they keep it from creeping in and, and the crown really from siphoning off power from the localities? Uh, uh, a little context, I think, will help us to understand the significance of this debate. 
So this was actually in an exhibit at the MHS upstairs. I highly recommend the work of the curators. Um, the exhibits at MHS are so wonderful. This was on display along with a fashion exhibit. I don't know how fashionable this coat is, but it's an important coat. And for me, as I was thinking through the Dan Forth notebook, and I've been thinking through these issues of arbitrary rule and how ordinary people express it, I, I went up one time, I think it was during lunchtime, and I had a few extra minutes and I was just looking at this coat. So this coat belonged to John Leverett, who's later the governor of Massachusetts Bay. Earlier, he like Danforth is a magistrate. Uh -uh, it's oxide, it's a buff coat. And according to the wonderful curatorial paragraph that was right beside it in the exhibit, it might actually have blood from the English Civil War still on the coat, <laughs> like that big stain you're seeing in the front. So Leverett fought on the parliamentary side of the English Civil War. And then he ends up in New England, and he's actually major general at the moment of the constitutional crisis of the 1660s. And so when these English officials come over and try and tell New Englanders how to redesign their government, it's Leverett who greets them on the waterfront. Was he wearing this coat? Maybe. <laughs> with the blood from the English Civil War. I mean, this just made it so vivid for me. And, you know, the, the history of New England has often, often been told in, in, you know, kind of an isolated way, not always. But, you know, one of the things I and a whole bunch of other scholars are trying to do is really think of it as a, a history that fits into the broader Anglo-American uh, world, also into broader Indigenous context. And so some of the questions that this coat has helped me ask is, you know, how can we trace these continuities between the English Civil War, which is driven in part by Puritan or Calvinist resistance theory? Again, what can a king do? What lines can the king not cross? Um, the, the topic of my book, which is New Englanders' defiance of the royal commissioners, I'll talk more about them in the 1660s. And then moving forward, you know, there's going to be a revolution in England, another one in the 1680s, what we sometimes call the Glorious Revolution or the Williamite Revolution and the Whig parties behind that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of Puritans who are involved in the Whig party. So, so you know, it's strange that we don't, we don't always think of these continuities. We don't always think of these major political events together. But, you know, the coat helps us to do that. I'm convinced that the... The, the buff coat uh, helps me to think about the the continuities and, and also change over time, but especially because John Leverett uh, lives through these events. Okay, this is Charles II. Uh, as many of you know, the 1660s are one of the most challenging moments politically in the history of early New England. And, you know, I, I the book is really, for the most part, about a decade. And when I started the project, I thought, oh, this is going to be easy, right? How easy can it be to write the history of a decade? Um, but then I started to get deeper into the archives, both in England and in the United States, and I discovered thousands of manuscript pages, um, you know, just writing and writing and writing and writing about the constitutional crisis, about the issue of how much power a distant ruler is going to have in New England. And, you know, Charles II comes in with all kinds of promises. He says there's going to be amnesty for the people who fought against his father in the English Civil Wars, you know, for people like Puritans. Of course, they win the Civil War. Uh, they enter England enters into this experimental kind of Republican phase of its history called the interregnum in the 1650s that falls apart and nobody knows if there's going to be another civil war. So, so in the first chapter of the book, I talk about the civil war, especially the regicide. So the 1649 death of Charles the first, the, the judicial execution of Charles the first at the end of the Civil War, and how that political event really cast a shadow over how people like Puritans are going to deal with Charles the second and his agents. I mean, they they are going to have a hard time trusting each other. Uh, they're, they have even a harder time trusting each other after a newly elected Cavalier Parliament 
in England starts passing legislation, which sometimes is called the Clarendon Code, um, basically legislation, which makes people like Puritans, Baptists, Quakers, anybody who's not high royalist Church of England, uh, into second-class citizens. So these religious minorities are going to be ejected from the pulpits of the Church of England. They're, they can't get jobs in universities or even schools, and they can't hold civil office in England. And so, you know, as you can imagine, people in New England are trying to figure out what's going to happen to us. You know, wh where do we fit into this empire? What, you know, what, what's going what's gonna to happen to all that we've built? And so I can imagine, you know, of course, people like Danforth, but also people all across the social spectrum, women, you know, they're trying to figure out some tough questions. And, you know, one of the things that's happening in England at the time is the people who actually signed the, the death warrant for Charles I back in 1649. They're sometimes called regicides. Um, and, and anybody who's sort of associated with him or associated with the death of the king or, or justifying the death of Charles I, they don't get amnesty. They start getting hunted down and killed. And some of them, of course, escaped to New England, and that's part of the book too. Um, but but news reports of the torture and execution of these people, uh, the ones who don't get amnesty, that starts filtering back to New England. And so there's a husband and wife, Amos and Elizabeth Richardson. They're Bostonians. They're, they're relatively well off. And uh, Elizabeth's brother is a merchant, and he's just come back from Virginia. So I can kind of imagine her waiting on the dock to meet meet her brother as the shallop brings him in from the larger boat. And uh, and they both hear the news of what's happened to this one man, Hugh Peter, who's you know he's kind of an eccentric guy, but he was one of the founders of many New England institutions. He founds their system of poor relief. He he goes back to England. He serves as chaplain for Oliver Cromwell. Anyway, he's one of the guys who in October 1660, even though he's not exactly a regicide, he's um, put under trial and he's executed. He's tortured and then executed. And, and they get news from Elizabeth Richardson's brother about that event. And Amos Richardson, as you can see here, he doesn't know what to say about it. It's just too horrifying. He says, it's so bad, I cannot tell how to speak of it. I just can't even, I can't. I can't tell how to speak of it in regard of Mr. Peters and diverse others. Elizabeth Richardson's a little bit more straightforward, right? She, she just says it flat out. She says, there's many put to death, 10 in one day, hang, drawn, and quartered. It's a method of execution. General Harrison, Mr. P Peters, 50 and all, so to be served. You know, she is she is facing it head on in a way that comes through really clearly in these in these manuscript um, papers of her letters and other people's letters at the MHS. So um, you know, the details of this report, the 50 and all to be served, they actually turn out to be somewhat exaggerated, but I think what comes across here in her letters is the fear, you know, even the terror that accompanies these executions. Again, people are trying to figure out what kind of a king is this, you know, who allows this to happen. And, and again, what's going to happen to New England? All of this seems somewhat distant until Charles II and his council send four royal commissioners over to New England in 1664. What you probably know about these royal commissioners is that they're the ones who go down to New Netherland and uh, turn New Netherland into New York. So they conquer the Dutch colony, make it an English colony. It's not actually as quick and easy as that makes it sound. It takes a while. There is uh, some bloodshed. But after they conquer New Netherland, turn it into New York, then they come up and they tour New England. And 
this is where, I mean, so many fascinating things happen. Most of my book is about their tour, how they go from place to place and all the negotiations that happen and all the different kind of people who get involved, who when, you know, when they feel like the institutions that they've built are threatened, you know, it was astonishing to me as I went through the manuscript records, how many different kinds of people got involved in these debates. So for example, you know, they go down to Plymouth first, they think it's a tiny colony, surely they're pushovers, you know, maybe 1500 people, Anglo-Americans in Plymouth at this point. And so the Royal Commissioners waltz in and they, they say, um, hey, Plymouth, Freeman, wouldn't you like to trade your freely elected governorship, your right to freely elect your governor, for a signed and sealed royal charter that we will sponsor. And the Plymouth folks have to, I mean, oh my goodness, I picture them staying up all night. I mean, they don't have a charter, so they're vulnerable. And these guys have just offered them the possibility of a royal charter. That's real legitimacy in this new empire. And 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 they debate and they debate and they debate. And, and then they actually say it's not worth it. You know, if we don't get to elect our governor, if the king gets to appoint among nominees our governor, we we're just giving it up. We're giving up all that we've built. And 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 you know, this also says something about how much they trust that king. Uh so 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 that's one of the events. Another one is, you know, the the Royal Commissioners go into Massachusetts Bay and they claim on a document that they hand over that they have full absolute power over the courts over the militia, over natural resources like forests. Um, and, and you can imagine how well that goes over. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a really uh, amazing series of, of conversations and, and negotiations. Um, you know, just in a third quick episode, they, they go down to Narragansett country. They try to take over the Shawmets ancestral land. They deal directly with Pomum and his son and, um, and, and, you know, this is another set of events that, um, you know, this one took me almost a year to just figure out what happened. But basically, Pomum is a really savvy uh, guy. And he is, there. there's absolutely no way he, he strings them along, right? There's no way that he's going to give up his ancestral land, which is on uh, what we think of as Warwick, Rhode Island. And uh, and Roger Williams gets involved, and John Elliott gets involved, and 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 they end up. Uh, I can just say the the particular royal commissioner who was pretty much after that land uh, leaves in a very disappointed fashion. So so in many different pockets of early New England, across you know all kinds of different towns and villages, there is an astonishing level of political participation as men and women, young and old. You know, people people learn how to think about limits on power. They learn how to think about what people can tell them to do and what people can't tell them to do. They learn to articulate the grounds of their liberty. Okay, so the 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 showdown, at least uh, in terms of Anglo American politics, of the Royal Commissioners tour happens in Boston. The Royal Commissioners, Boston, of course, is the largest, wealthiest of the colonies. It's the one that the Royal Commissioners really target. Uh, their leader, the Royal Commissioners' leader, is a guy named Richard Nichols. He's later going to be governor of New York. And, and they try in lots of different ways to intimidate Massachusetts leaders into taking an oath of unconditional allegiance to the new king and to his heirs and successors forever. And I'm going to Bought back to the Danforth notebook here. So this is in that same notebook I was talking about earlier. This is what Danforth says about the oath. And, and let me just say, there's a lot of pressure on the magistrates to take this oath. At one point, Richard Nichols actually gets in Governor Richard Bellingham's face and says, you know, the king expects you to do it. You know, he just, he's like, right there in his face. So so I don't know that he did that directly to Danforth, but but this is what Danforth says, and he writes it down in his own notebook, which could have been used as evidence for sedition, right? So the fact that he writes it down is, is risky in itself. He says this, before I take the oath of allegiance to his majesty, which I'm ready to do, I do declare that I will be so understood 
as not to infringe the liberty and privileges granted in his majesty's royal charter to this colony of Massachusetts. And then in case we didn't realize what was happening, he says, when the oath was given me in court by the royal commissioners, I thus openly declared, and a copy hereof is left on file under my hand. It's almost, I don't know what sense you guys get from reading this, but I read it and I'm like, wow, I think he's kind of proud of us. <laughs> you know, I think he's, he's like, yeah, look at this. I'm leaving it on file. But, you know, he's, he, again, he has the sense that he's living in this, this historic moment. So, you know, he basically says, yeah, I'm loyal to the king. I mean, I think most people in New England wanted to be loyal to the king. They're not, they're not super radicals. Uh, but but there's there's lines the king can't cross, and and one of those is the liberty and privileges in the charter in that 1629 charter, and and that includes of course the ability to run their own government, to freely elect their own leaders, and to run their own churches. So so this is Danforth's response to the pressure to uh, take the oath. You know, in, in the end, the leaders of Massachusetts Bay, also to a certain extent, uh, Plymouth and, and to a lesser extent, but also in significant ways, Connecticut, uh, you know, they actually, the leaders have the support of most of the townspeople, lots of different people and get involved in petitions and fast days and all different kinds of mobilizing happens. And these are people, again, of across the social spectrum. I was really surprised to find that. I was surprised to find how many people who didn't even have voting rights were involved in the political process. And they get together and they actually defy the royal commissioners. They compromise on certain things. And then on the things that matter most to them, uh, the, they, they defy the royal commissioners. They they simply refuse to let the crown redesign local institutions to benefit royal interests. So as you can imagine, the royal commissioners leave Boston in a huff. They're grumbling about those seditious Puritans. Uh, they travel elsewhere. They actually, at that point, try to take over part of Narragansett country with the Shawmets that I talked about. They also try to take over New Hampshire and Maine. After that, nobody knows what's going to happen. You know, would the king station some warships in Boston Harbor? That's a plan that's circulating in London at the time. If you go pretty deep into the Q archives and the National Archives, they could see all the plans that people were putting forward. Um, yeah, maybe some warships, maybe an embargo. People are talking about it um, for various reasons. They think that might push the Bay into a more radical position so they don't do it. Um, but nobody knows what's going to happen. I mean, they have defied Charles II's royal commissioners. Nobody knows what's going to happen. So one of the royal commissioners, a guy named George Cartwright, he sets back to sail. Uh, he sets sail to London. He has a whole bundle of papers which have evidence for these New Englanders' defiance. Um, wouldn't you know he gets captured by Dutch pirates? Uh, there's actually really kind of funny fast date. I'm sorry, that's mean to Cartwright, but there's fast eight notes about this episode and and new englanders of course think it's entirely providential you know god's hand must have been with those dutch pirates and uh and the fast eight notes say that the dutch pirates gag cartwright with a with a cloth in his mouth just like he threatened to gag the colonists right of course right? this providential logic cartwright um you know has a tough time but he does make his way free he finally goes back to London, and he issues a scathing report. He basically says Puritans can never be truly loyal to the monarchy. You need to whip these people into line. Uh, at that point, that's when, in 66, Charles II calls for the presence in London of Governor Richard Bellingham and another magistrate, William Hawthorne. He says, I, I want to hold you accountable. You need to show up. And this is the moment of the 1666 debate that Danforth records. And, you know, again, it's a major constitutional issue. Can the king demand individuals to sail to London simply because he wants them to? You know, they haven't committed a crime. This is just because the king 
wants them face to face. He wants to hold them accountable. It would almost be like, I was trying to think of an analogy for this. I'm sure you can think of a better one, but you know, if president Biden demands governor Mara Healy's presence in DC, except that it took six weeks to travel to DC, which is what it would have taken for a ship to cross the ocean. I mean, I don't know, imagine like really serious holiday traffic and he, he calls her to immediately be drive to, to DC. Um, and, you know, maybe also in this scenario, there's a strong chance that Biden will send Healy to some kind of a tower, like Tower of London, uh, if he doesn't like what she says. You know, this is the kind of risk that that these people are dealing with. Uh, so, so this is the context for the debate in 1666. The Council of Massachusetts Bay, who are the elected, at-large elected leaders in the colony, they are debating what the king can do what he can't do, the constitutional balance between local government and the crown. Now, there's this interesting note in uh, the the writings of the Secretary of State back in England, the guy named the Earl of Clarendon. And he had quipped earlier when he was talking about in New England, this is way before, he's like, I just can't imagine a colony ever having the courage to refuse the king's demand for any person, though it were for the governor himself. It's like, it's beyond what he can think that a colony could ever say no to the king, even if he demanded a governor, like that would be the test case. And he's like, it's unthinkable. I cannot imagine that, that any colony leaders would do that. Well, back to the Danforth notebook. Um, Okay, so, so this is, this was kind of exciting to discover. Parts of this notebook were transcribed way back in the early days of the MHS in in 1826 in one of those beautiful collection volumes. But they left parts out. And one of the parts they leave out is the prayer that precedes the debate. Now, we could could discuss maybe why they left it out, why it wasn't interesting to them. I don't know. There are six ministers who are involved. They are at the meeting of the court. They are heavyweight intellectuals. These are, you know, people of multiple master's degrees. It's John Wilson from Boston, Jonathan Mitchell, one of the great second generation intellectuals uh, from Cambridge. Now, I, I probably don't need to say this. As we all know, Massachusetts Bay is not a theocracy. You know, these ministers can only advise. They have no direct political authority. They're there only because the council invited them to be there. Um but you know they're they're also in some ways their job is to give a pep talk. I mean they're they're trying to set the tone for you know what another one at a later point is going to call a rational and godly consensus. They're they're trying to set the tone of you know the magistrates being able to make hard decisions. Um, so one of the ministers we don't know which one he gives a mini sermon, and if you read these notes carefully, you can you can almost get the cadence of it from from reading the notes it's almost like being in the room and hearing it and and the overall theme of the mini sermon is don't react in fear don't let fear take over and and the language of it goes like this it, he says you know you're now poor and afflicted i get it you do not have the power that the crown has but the lord has many ways to save his people how many he has a thousand ways. And, and this becomes the sermon's refrain. So you can, you know, you can see it. Uh, you know, he, how many, how many? He's got many ways. How many? A thousand ways. It, it's over and over again. And and then this quote I've got up, uh, if God can turn the heart of Saul to David, can he hurt, turn the heart of the king to us? And you can imagine, right? This kind of a call and response thing. You can imagine these were interactive occasions. And he says, yeah, he's got many ways. Let there be decrees sent forth. God can alter such a decree. So, you know, the overall point of the pep talk is fear God, yes, but don't fear humans. And you should not cleave unconditionally to any earthly power. Okay, so that sets the context for the debate. Uh, Debate itself, everybody agrees the colony has its own laws. They are not under the direct jurisdiction of the English parliament or English courts. It's so interesting because this gets debated later on at the, you know, John Adams in the time of the American Revolution, people debate this, but quite clear to the room in 1666, they are not under the jurisdiction of English parliament or directly under English courts. 
But the king's direct command, that that's more difficult. That's that's tricky. So this one guy, Daniel Dennison, he's uh, a guy with a lot of legal training. And he basically says, you need to be cautious. You know, the king's sovereignty reaches to English controlled territories on the coast of France. So geography doesn't matter. And then he says this prerogative, meaning the king's power is as necessary as law and is for the good of the whole. And this is basically a truism of English political theory in the 17th century. He says the privileges of subjecthood imply the duties of obedience. You need to be careful and you need to really, really do what the king tells you to do. Pretty quickly, another magistrate, William Hathorne, who's one of the ones who's got to go if, if they decide that, um, says, listen, we, we can never pretend the English civil wars didn't happen. Prerogative is not above law, but limited by it. I mean, the issue with Charles I and the English civil war is that he's so overreached and, and really tried to rule without parliament, tried to rule about the law. So he says, you can't pretend that didn't happen. Right? Prerogative is not above law, but limited by it. And another guy uh, who who has a lot of also a lot of legal training and served as commissioner in Oliver Cromwell's Navy, so he's he's had this high office. His name is Francis Willoughby, and and he says, you know, we got to think about the big picture here. How easily may the king in one year undo all that God has done? And, and what he means is that they've tried to build reformed political institutions and reformed churches that, that you know, reflect, um, an, you know, a political system that doesn't, let me just say, that doesn't benefit elites, right? That 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 has more uh, to, benefits ordinary people in different ways. Uh, you know, this debate is extraordinary, and there's so much more I could say about it. And you know, it wasn't easy. I don't want to pretend like these guys just found consensus. They didn't. I think these were very, very hard conversations. And I think one of the reasons they kept going, and we have a lot of evidence of this, is that people in the towns basically tell them, you've got to figure it out, right? We don't want a bunch of division. We don't want a bunch of factionalism. You elected leaders, you've got to figure this out. There may not be a perfect solution. You may have to choose among bad options, but you need to make a decision and 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 rule with rational and godly interest of the people at heart. Um, we actually have one moment where Danforth kind of lets us into his mind and his heart. He he writes this. You know, he's you can imagine him like up late at night, really frustrated and and just not even sure it's they're ever going to be able to figure out what to do. And he says, no orderly debate can be had to know the mind of the court. Some fearing these actings will precipitate our ruin. Others apprehending that to act further will necessitate our ruin. Like basically, we're <laughs> either way, this is looking bad. Here is man's weakness and extremity. And then there's the shift. What a favor will it be if it may be God's opportunity that it may be so for mercy to us and ours, the Lord grant. You know, you can just, you can hear him right there, right? I, I hear a different voice there than I hear in the rest of the notebook. Um, you know, Danforth and the other magistrates, they they talk late into the night. Lots of other debates I could talk about. Um, in the end, I'll spoiler alert, they do it. They decide to defy the king's direct command. It is astonishing. You know, Earl of Clarendon, you know, he just couldn't have imagined it happening, but but they do. They defy the king's direct command. And uh, this is the part of the story that might be a little bit more well known. But instead of sending Bellingham and Hathorne, the two guys that the king demanded, come to London, they send a form of tribute. They send these beautiful, tall, three feet in diameter tree trunks. Uh, masts for the king's royal navy. And of course, the king at that moment is in the Anglo-Dutch War. He's fighting the Dutch, not just in New Netherland, but fighting for control of the slave trade on the West African coast. This is the same king who charters the Royal Africa Company and really uh, injects cash into the slave trade. So, you know, this is a this is a, a much larger political moment. And it happens that the king really needed those masts. <laughs> Those are valuable commodities. 
And for the time being, uh, you know, actually for the next 20 years, uh, New Englanders get to keep their elected governor governors. They, they get to keep their, their local institutions. Um, you know, one of the things, again, I wasn't expecting to find in the sources was the number of ordinary people in this charge moment the number of ordinary people who pressured their elected leaders to find consensus. You know, the magistrates are trying to figure it out, and it's not clear. There are not easy answers. But New Englanders across the social spectrum, you know, in petitions and letters and uh, verbal accounts that are recorded in lots of different ways, uh, they tell the magistrates repeatedly that you need to work together and figure it out. And so what I found over the course of this research was that in this moment of crisis, New Englanders, you know, recalling the events of the English Civil War, but also reacting to this extraordinary pressure from London and from the Royal Commission, they form a constitutional culture. They, they embrace a set of ideas and practices for setting limits on the power of rulers and fending off what they see as arbitrary rule. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Adrian. That was wonderful. Um, and again, we're so very happy to see how far the project came from when it was a proposal, um, and then the research, the hard research in the reading room, and then uh, to publication. So congratulations on this wonderful achievement. Thank you, Kevin. We've got questions that are uh, trickling in, um, but I thought I would um, start by inviting you to talk a little bit more about the research process. This was a very lengthy, frustrating process. I take it you're talking about taking a year to piece together what, um, what happened in one instance. And I'll also point out um, that it can be very difficult to write a history of a 10-year period as a Civil War historian. Um, it can be very difficult right. to write a, a, the history of a very short period and time. But uh, let's talk a little bit about the process of writing this. Well, you know, there th th at certain moments, I know many of you have done this kind of research, and and you just think, how 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 is this ever going to end? <laughs> One one of the most fun moments, and you know, this also was a tribute to the just the role that librarians and archivists play in this process. We really could not do the work we do without the libraries. Um, but I started coming across a whole bunch of shorthand, which is just a it's not code, it's not cipher, it's just a it's just a short way of writing. It's like speed writing. And uh, and there's manuals for it. And so uh an, an a, a curator, actually, an archivist, came to me and he's like, he's like, why don't you just try to read it? And I was really frustrated. I was like, what is this stuff? Has somebody ever, you know, figured it out? And he's like, it's it's not that hard. Just figure it out. <laughs> you know? And so I remember, um, and, and uh, you know, I, I found the manual and, and, and figured it out. And, and I actually realized, yeah, you could. So so then that slows down the process a lot. Later on, I train my students to do it because students love it. It's like Sudoku. You know, they just think they, 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 they it's like a code. They just have fun with it. Right. So I have students who can who can read the 17th century shorthand. But for this project, some of it I was doing myself. And uh, oh, boy. <laughs> You know, it's fun because you find cool things that nobody's read, but boy, does it take time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and and then, you know, the archives on, you know, there's there's this enormous field of history on the English side of Restoration England, and it's ex excellent scholarship, terrific scholarship. And and I think that was the, the real challenge of the book was pulling together the manuscript evidence, the historiography on the New England side with all this really top-notch scholarship on the English side and and find finding a way to tell that story that wasn't just about New England. That's about, you know, it's New England, but it's it's really a lot of other things going on in um Tangier and Barbados and Virginia. And, you know, there's, you know, there's also the Portuguese side and there's, you know, there's a there's just it's a lot. And so that was one of the challenges was was trying to master this scholarship on the English side and, and tell it as, uh, you know, like it was, right? Which is which is a story that happens in the context of broader empires. Well, you, I mean, you, you've done such a good job of weaving all of this together. Uh, I mean, it, it, you build this sense of tension through the book too. There's a palpable fear that those in Massachusetts and, and uh, in, in, in the colonies are feeling 
they're such a, they're at such a remove from what's happening in London. And <laughs> I was wondering if you talk a little bit more about this um, this the, the importance of distance, the fear, mm -hmm. the role that distance plays in all of this. There's a moment where you talk about <clears throat> how no one remembers in London the traditions of how you coronate a new king because the last mm -hmm. time this happened king charles the first that's who remembers that and now all of, and then there was the interregnum and now you've got charles the second what are the what's the process of all of that and it strikes me that there are people in new england in the in the colonies who have no memory of what it was like to live under a monarch um that there there's this young generation that's taking taking shape. And I'm wondering if there are any of their voices that are incorporated in this that you found uh, a part of this. So so the, 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 the two issues, the distance and then this this issue of a, maybe a generational uh, difference in how they perceive or interpret events that are taking place. No, oh, it's a it's a terrific question. And and yeah, in a way, it has two parts because people in in London really don't know much about the colonies and their political institutions and how things work. So they're scrambling to figure things out. And then people in the colonies, yeah, there's this huge debate about, you know, how soon do you proclaim the king? Uh, I mean, some colonies, uh, Rhode Island proclaims Charles II pretty pretty quickly. Of course, they just, you know, are hoping for this charter to come through, which it does in 1663. Um they, you know, Connecticut's figuring it out. John Winthrop Jr. is on the scene in London trying to negotiate it. Um, it. What if the king has only a brief hold on power? You know, there's rumors. Uh, you know, one chapter of the book is about what kind of news people had and when. So how does political information work? How does it spread? Where does it come from? What kind of information do people have at various times? And uh, and And so, you know, Maybe the king's securely on the throne. Maybe he's not. If you proclaim him too soon, and then it turns out he's not on the throne, and there's a new republic or or a revamped republic. Whoops! <laughs> you know, now you're on the wrong side. So, um, lots lots of debates over that. And then they're even like, should we drink healths? You know, basically take a shot, say something nice about the king. D should we do that? Should we not? Is that weird? You know, they're. <laughs> <laughs> they're 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 you know it, it, exactly what you were saying kid Pe people don't they, they don't know the script it's it's been a long time and they don't know the script so of course they do end up proclaiming the king and then you know they get the advice of the ministers which again not not binding but they do ask the ministers as kind of the local intelligentsia to give advice and and the ministers say yeah high but not too high is what your congratulations should be like high but not Sorry, <laughs> you know, be careful. Uh, you know, play it, play it carefully is is the the gist of of their advice there. So I think that's that's in that moment that's pretty much what they do. They don't always take the minister's advice, but in that case, they do. Very good. Uh, we have a question here from Betsy Kasdan. Uh, hi, Adrian. Hi, this is fascinating. I wonder how you fit in the 1661 mandamus from the king that forces Massachusetts to release Quaker prisoners and not execute anymore. Quakers look to the king as a guard against Massachusetts overreach. It seems, where does that fit? Oh, thank you, Betsy, for that great question. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time studying Quaker history, and actually one of the things that got me into this era of the 1660s from the beginning was the Quaker sources, because uh, especially, and Betsy knows this well, Elizabeth Hooten, who's one of George Fox's first converts, she's a, a preacher, a female preacher, a model for a whole generation of female preachers. She travels to New England, and she basically sets herself up as a kind of unofficial spy for the royal commissioners. I mean, you don't think that Quakers are going to be royalists. That seems odd to us, because they seem kind of anti-institutional in, in certain ways. But but actually, in this moment, they also are trying to not get put in prison in England and elsewhere, and they want more favorable laws. And they think, well, maybe, you know, this king, he says a lot of tolerationist type things in 1660, 1661. And so, and so the Quakers are thinking, well, maybe, maybe this is our moment. And so they go and, you know, he, he, George Fox is in prison at one point, and then um, Margaret Fell gets him out. And there's all kind of interesting things that are happening on the Quaker side. But, but what happens 
in a nutshell with the Quakers is that they set them up, they set themselves up as kind of ambassadors for the king in New England. And that does a couple of things. It it makes the other New Englanders less trusting of the monarchy because they think of Quakers as people who just want to tear down governments. They think of them as people who don't have any modicum of respect for you know, local authority, Quakers going to court meetings and break bottles and say, God's going to judge everybody. And, you know, they, they interrupt church services. People just, you know, that this is not, well, we can talk a lot about Quakers. Um, so, so the Quakers actually stage a series of political spectacles and I won't get into those in deep detail, but they make sure that they stage their political spectacles at a moment when the Royal Commissioners are in Boston and everybody's watching. And so they have their own agenda, which overlaps to a certain extent, but not entirely with the agenda of the royal commissioners. And what it does in the end is it raises the stakes for everybody. Thank you. Uh, Here's another question. Let's see here. Did the English crown make a mistake with those original charters that did not hold the new colonies under the parliament? Ooh. Or put in another way, what would have been the reasons the monarchy left the parliament out of those colonial charters? That is such an interesting question. I'm trying to think if there would have been any precedent for that. Um, I mean, you've got the Dutch, the Dutch charters, par- they're representative assembly is more involved. Yeah, it's, it's a terrific question. I haven't actually thought about that kind of a what if. Um, I mean, it does create a, a, a difficult constitutional situation because technically, you know, the entire political legitimacy of the colonies is in those royal charters, which are granted by the crown. And I mean, Parliament, of course, can can navigate for trade, the, the Navigation Acts, which are very, very difficult to enforce. So Parliament does have that power, but it's it's not a direct power of legislating on on local issues. So, yeah, I have to. I might have to think more about that one. What 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 might have happened? But but it does create. You know, you know, when when you like the king, it's fine to have a royal charter. When you are suspicious of the king and you think he might just be trying to extract from you and take away your local authority, it's a different thing to have a royal charter. But you know, New Englanders are not. Um, again, they're not hyper radicals. They they're okay with monarchy. They have no trouble with monarchy in 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 most circumstances, a few exceptions. But 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 they want a constitutional monarchy. They want they want a monarchy that has limits. Yes, they make very clear. Um, all right, here's a note from uh, Joe Edelman, uh, who says, "Hello from Danforth's Farms, or as Google Maps calls it, Framingham. You mentioned Massachusetts officials dealing with indigenous peoples at various points. Can you talk a little more about whether, and if so, how?" colonists saw a link between their relationship with London and policy towards natives. Yes, I spend a lot of time on this in the book. And I just gave a talk down in Bristol, Rhode Island, about the Shawmut side of the story, um, which is which is just fascinating. Um, so, I mean, the royal commissioners in their instructions and then also in their own language, the instructions we think are probably written by the Earl of Clarendon, maybe with some other input, they basically have all of this high sounding moral language about how you're supposed to honor native treaties and do all the right things and make sure to offer them Christianity, um, you know, to the infidels. And, you know, it's all this for the time, high sounding moral language. And, you know, as many scholars have argued, the the monarchy's very moral legitimacy is in part based on being nicer to indigenous people than the Catholic empires were. So there's this competition that goes on there. So, so if you just read those documents at face value, you're going to think, oh, wow, King, those royal commissioners, aren't they great, <laughs> you know, to to want to honor native treaties. But, you know, as with all these things, you got to figure out what they're saying and then what they're doing. And on the ground, what you see happening 
is, you know, the rug commissioners actually meet with Pescus, this old, older Narragansett sachem, venerable sachem. And, uh, and, and, you know, Samuel Gorton is involved and, um, a lot of things happen, but, but basically what they do is they accept tribute and then they say it's, it's the King's province, you know? Um, and, and it's, there's this poignant moment that I, I still don't really know what to do with where, where Pescus is like, fine. I mean, the tribute's not very much. So, you know, fine. He actually sends this beautiful gift of, um, uh, feathers, uh, to, to the queen. It never makes it to her, which is sad. I think, um, I don't know. They thought it wasn't worth sending on a ship or something, but, um, anyway, he, he's like his one request in this moment is, would you please keep hard liquor from entering my territory? Can you please keep it out? Because he, and then he has this little mini speech where he says, this is what's happening. Uh, with the younger generation. And, uh, you know, so it's tough to talk about scholars. So we have to be really careful how we talk about these things. Um, but that's, you know, as far as we know, that's that's what happened in that conversation. And, you know, again, 1662, the king has rechartered the Royal Africa Company. That's about enslavement on the West African coast. It's also about rum. And, and there, you know, sugar production, of course, rum. So, the, you know, the, when you look at what the royal commissioners are actually doing on the ground, they don't keep their promises. And, um, you know, there's just, there, you know, royal commissioners, they, they say all kind of nice things, but they, they do nothing. Uh, to to address any of these actual concerns that are that are spoken and 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 you know I'm not saying anybody handles this well they don't um, but uh, but you know I, I actually you know Pesicus and and Pamum and the different uh, Native American leaders who show up in the manuscripts and I looked for them so as much as I possibly could um, you know they they understand the political situation I think better than some of us give them credit for there's some some really interesting. Uh, political maneuvering that happens on the on the 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 native side. They do, and they're the source of information for many of um, some of the colonists too. I mean, they're they they know what's going on. Yeah, sure. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Anna Lawrence. Could you say more about how this time period opens some paths for women's political voices and participation? Yeah, thank you. I was looking for women's voices, uh, you know, also in the manuscript record, and you, it's 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 so frustrating when you don't find more of it. But I did find a few moments I was pretty excited about. So you know, things like Elizabeth Winthrop, um, you know, even when her husband, who John Winthrop Jr., who's the governor of Connecticut, even when he's off in London negotiating Connecticut's new charter, Elizabeth Winthrop is a hub of information. So she's getting the news sheets. Uh, she's divvying out information to the people she thinks needs it. You know, she's, it, it's, she, she plays a really significant role. Um, you also have, you know, this great Connecticut housewife, good wife, good wife, uh, Wateris, who finds out about the death of Hugh Peter. And she's so angry. It just pops off the page. She's like, basically she's talking about the King. She says, you know, I, I would be his death. Like she's like, she's, she, I mean, most people are not thinking about a second regicide, but man, good wife water. She's, she's, she's really frustrated when the Royal commissioners go up and they try to take over Portsmouth and New Hampshire. You've got, you know, women with boiling kettles uh, who basically like you come into my house, you try to tell me what to do, you know? So, you know, there's all different ways that, that, that women are involved, you know, often at times it shows up in the court records and that's a particular kind of document. So we tend to get more seditious women or potentially seditious women than we get, um, you know, folks who are, you know, d doing, doing the everyday thing. But, um, but yeah, it's, they, they do show up. And, and I, you know, I hope that the way that I've looked for them and, and the way that they show up in the court records and reading those documents, and we even have a woman who signed a petition. I'd love to know if that carries on. And I'd love, I'd love to know if female petition signing, uh, when, when that picks up again, but Cambridge, um, there's, there's a woman named Rebecca who signs, signs one of the town petitions and she's a widow. And actually, this is one thing if, you know, I don't know if I'm going to write this book, but somebody should, there's widows um, have 
much more political rights and legal rights than other women do. And so they show up a lot more in the records than other kinds of women. And it would be, it would be great to, for somebody to trace that. So someone else who also shows up in your book is Daniel Gukin, whom you're spending some more time with, with your next projects. What's his role in all of this? Oh, right. Um, so Gukin is a magistrate, so he's on the council. He's also the commissioner for Indian Affairs. So he, like John Elliott, his good friend, are regularly in Natick and Hasnamesid and, and the various, um, you know, semi-autonomous, Christianized uh, native towns. Gukin is a terrific example of somebody, you know, it's kind of like going back to the buff coat, to Leverett's coat. Gukin is one of those people who fought in the English Civil Wars and lives all the way to the 1680s. And he's really involved in the 1660s constitutional con contest. And he's also really involved in the 1680s. And he talks about that. He talks about how he's informed by what happened in the English Civil Wars when he's in the 1660s. And then when you get to the 1680s, which is the last chapter of the book, he talks about why what they did in the 1660s matters and and how they've already been through this once before you know when when andros tries to create the super colony the dominion of new england and he basically combines all the governments from new jersey to maine and and takes away all local governments pretty much uh taxes the heck out of people you know gookin's like listen guys remember the 1660s we, we know what arbitrary rule is like. We've done this before. And so now we know what to do. And so he's he's one of those people, in, and I don't talk about him a, a ton in this book. I'll, I will much more in the next projects. But he's one of those people who, who really connects the dots for us in terms of political theory. Right. Thank you. And we're going to end with a question which I'm sure comes up at every single one of your book talks. Um, and we're going to combine two, so there'll be a little bit of a twist here. But um, do you think that the elements of the American Revolution were already laid down in the 1600s? And you think the sense of autonomy and liberty of the Mass Bay Colony is something that we still have today in Massachusetts? Mm, I love this question. I'm still thinking about this question. I, I wish we were in person and we could have a more of a more of a conversation about this you know uh i mean it's a long 18th century there's a lot of intellectual and and political and practical strands that that make their way into the america revolution so i'm not in, i'm not in any way you know there were sort of old whiggish arguments that link puritanism directly to all forms of liberty and and i'm not trying to make those kind of arguments i think it, there's a lot of strands but I would also say, I don't want to underplay it, you know, this, especially Puritan political theory and Calvinist resistance theory and the kind of practical manifestations of that and petitioning and town meeting and fast days and the ways people got organized and the ways they were able to articulate arbitrary rule, you know, these matter. They're, they're, I'll stand by it. There is a reason why the American Revolution starts in Massachusetts Bay. I mean, these people pass on these kind of both intellectual and practical traditions, what I'm calling a constitutional culture, they pass it down around the fireplace and election day sermons and town meetings. I mean, there is a strand and I think it's an important one. I think we're going to have to end it there. That's a great note. We still have questions coming in. There are so many of them. Olivia is going to make a copy of these questions and send them along to you. Um, and uh, we're going to encourage folks to um, check the chat. There is a code in there if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book. It's a fantastic book. It's also available as an audio book, apparently. Um, and so these are great stocking stuffers. Great. Uh, if you haven't done your holiday shopping yet, they make great gifts. Uh, it's well written. It's uh, deeply researched. And we just love that uh, Adrian is part of the MHS community and uh, started this project here. So thank you so much, Adrian, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, Ked. Thanks, everybody.